Next we have uh, State Senator Jamie Raskin. He's also a professor at American University Washington College of Law, director of its program in law and government, and founder of the Marshall Brennan Constitutional Literacy Project. I'm proud to think of him as a friend and one I've worked with on a wonderful youth chess program called All the Right Moves. I'll never forget the tournament in downtown Silver Spring we held a couple of years ago. The little kids finished early and uh, there weren't enough of us to take care of them all, so Jamie took them aside and for 20 minutes our state senator was playing Simon Says with a bunch of squealing, <laughs> squealing eight-year-olds. It, it was a great, great moment. Uh, I wish I had taken a picture of it. Anyway, uh, Jamie will be addressing whether the First Amendment permits the imposition of Sharia law or any other religious law as secular law and what the real threats are to the separation of church and state in America today. Great. Um, thank you, Joe. You know, uh, no good act goes unpunished. And uh, I've got to leave it promptly at 1 p.m. because I'm going back to Tacoma Park, my district. I'm, we're, we're attempting uh, a Simon Says demonstration that will be the largest in history and to beat the Guinness Book of World Records record for the number of kids participating in Simon Says. So I, when I leave, it's not because I'm going to be dodging all of your subtle questions. I've got to get back to my district for that. Okay, so, um, so uh, let's see. The, there are obviously forces in the country that would like us to have a, um, a holy war, uh, a showdown between uh, religions, uh, a clash of civilizations, uh, a series of religious witch hunts and vendettas and so on. And uh, my role here is simply to say, uh, let's, let's shift the conversation from religion and what different people's religions stand for to law. Because it is the law that we can repair to in times of uh, heated emotional controversy to try to clarify the issues that are really at stake. And I want to start just by telling you a, a little story about a case called uh, United States versus Newdow. Uh, and um, Mr. Newdow brought a challenge to uh, the Pledge of Allegiance in California because of the phrase One Nation Under God. And he's an atheist and he said that uh, he wanted his daughter to participate in the Pledge of Allegiance, like everybody else, but he didn't want her having to participate with the words One Nation Under God. So the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals um, upheld this challenge and said that there is no secular purpose whatsoever to the addition of the words One Nation Under God. Um, and it clearly has a religious intent. And these were both Republican appointees, by the way, who voted uh, to, to strike it down. Um, so there was a big storm of controversy, and I got a phone call from the uh, uh, a, uh, a TV talk show host to go on to discuss this. Uh, the um, uh, what is his name? O'Reilly, the O'Reilly. Oh, yeah. right? So, so he, so, and I didn't realize I was the designated liberal whipping post that night. Uh, <laughs> and so he said, "Well, you, you liberals don't want." Uh, to one nation under God, what should we be? And I said, well, if you're an originalist, you should go back to the original uh, Pledge of Allegiance as written by Francis Bellamy in 1892, which was just one nation indivisible with liberty and justice for all. He wrote it uh, as a way to stick it to the South because they were continuing to display the Confederate battle flag. So he wrote the Pledge of Allegiance in a very angry spirit saying, no, I pledge allegiance to my flag of the United States of America um, uh, one nation indivisible with liberty and justice for all. So I said, let's go back to the original. We don't, you know, it, it was the words one nation under God were added during the McCarthy period, interestingly, just several weeks after Brown versus Board of Education was decided by the Supreme Court. So I said, it was good enough when it started. Why don't we go back to that? He said, no, we've been one nation under God for 50 years. If we're not one nation under God, then what are we? So I said, I don't know, one nation under Canada? <laughs> this would be geographically correct, at least. And I said, no, you know, if you, if, you, if you want to be serious about it, we're one nation under the Constitution, because we're not one religious faith, we're not one ethnicity or race uh, or political party or ideology, but we do have one Constitution. And so it's the constitutional faith that I want to promote today. And so I come with a solution to the wars over Sharia law. 
And the solution is we don't need any extra laws against any imposition of uh, religious law. We've got one, and it's called the First Amendment to the Constitution of the United States. <laughs> and the, the First Amendment contains six rights, and one of those rights is against the establishment of a religion. So let's say somebody wanted to require that every public school open with an Islamic prayer in the morning. Well, we've got a case directly on point, 1962, called Engel versus Vitale, which struck down the legislative imposition of Christian prayer. And then, so some schools moved to readings from the Christian Bible and the Jewish Bible. That was struck down as well. So you could not impose a Muslim prayer because you can't impose a Christian prayer or a Jewish prayer. The Supreme Court decided that a half century ago. What if you wanted to have um, a religious prayer in the football huddle. You can't do that. The Supreme Court found in Santa Fe versus Doe uh, in 2000 that you can't have a Christian prayer uh, broadcast over the loudspeakers at a football game or in the huddle by the coach. What if you wanted to have uh, a Muslim prayer or Sharia law prayer, Muslim prayer, whatever, you know, however you want to phrase it, at uh, a high school graduation, a public high school graduation? You can't do that. The Supreme Court said in Lee versus Wiseman uh, that you can't have religious prayer uh, in in uh, public high schools. So, uh, well, what if what if you know a Muslim majority came to power in uh, Texas or Mississippi or Alabama and said we're going to put up uh, important provisions from the Quran in the front of every classroom? That would be unconstitutional under Stone versus Graham, 1980, which struck down the legislative imposition um, in Arkansas of the Ten Commandments in every school. You can't do it. It's already been struck down. So <clears throat> if there's any attempt to legislate the imposition of a religion, we have a long body of case law which already discredits that. Now, on the other side, we also have uh, a constitutional provision that guarantees the free exercise um, of religion. Um, now, does that mean that your religion gives you the right to opt out of secular law? Absolutely not. So, for example, the Rastafarians believe sincerely as part of their religious sacrament that they have a, a right to smoke marijuana. And our courts have said no. The law is that the free exercise clause does not give you the right to opt out of generally applicable uh, universal and neutral laws. It just, you, you don't have the right to do it. So I, I always like to try to give the other side of the argument the best benefit of the doubt. And there's one case that has been cited, one case that would give anybody pause that there has been some attempt to legislate Sharia law. And let me tell you what it is. I'm from New Jersey. It's called SD versus MJR, where uh, a wife and husband are, are estranged um, and he asserted that he had the right to continue to have sex with her under Sharia law. She went to court in New Jersey and got a temporary restraining order uh, to seek a temporary restraining order against him. And his defense was, under my religion, or under my interpretation of my religion, I have a right of sexual access to my wife regardless of the state of our relationship. Uh, and the original judge made a mistake. The original judge aired and said, well, he has a sincere religious faith in this. I'm not going to grant the temporary restraining order. It was immediately, that ruling was immediately reversed by an appellate court, which granted the TRO. And it's very clear that you cannot claim that you have some kind of religious right to beat your wife, to rape your wife, or what have you. It's very clear. There's no other case in the country that comes even remotely close to this. The mistake there was simply a judge's refusal to enforce what the state law is. People believe a lot of crazy things under the banner of religion. But under our free exercise clause, you don't have the right to do them because a general universally applicable law applies to you. Let's, let's look at the, the case of the, the World Trade Center, uh, the, the opposition that some people have to building a mosque within a certain undefined distance of where the uh, terrorist attacks took place on 9-11 a decade ago. Um, 
Does, does a, a mosque have the right to purchase a building uh, under the principles of free contract and set up a mosque there? Well, it has absolutely that right under the zoning laws of New York. If every other religion has the right, if you can build um, a Unitarian church there, if you can build um, a synagogue there, if you can build an Episcopalian or Presbyterian church there, of course you have a right to build a mosque there. Um, and it would be an absolute violation of the free exercise clause to legislate or to render a judicial ruling that one religion somehow has lesser rights under the zoning laws of New York than others. Because some people want to blame an entire religion for the acts of a band of terrorist fanatics. Um, that would clearly violate the free exercise clause. So, um, <clears throat> The, the, one, the one tricky area where it comes up, and it's not unique in any way to Sharia law, is in the reciprocal enforcement of foreign laws, where foreign laws refer to religious laws. So take the case of a, a couple that gets married in Israel, and Israel delegates the power of family law, including uh, marriage, to religions. So uh, to get married in Israel, you have to follow, in most cases, religious law. Well, if you get married in Israel, um, you get a formal uh, certificate of marriage from the state of Israel, which would be recognized under um, our choice of laws principles in the United States. We would recognize a marriage from Israel, despite the fact that it's based on religious law. Well, that's the case with dozens of countries around the world, including uh, a number of majority Muslim countries where the secular law is based on religious law in terms of defining a marriage. Now, <clears throat> if somebody were to come in and say, we want to legislate in Oklahoma or in Maryland or Virginia to say that marriages that take place in Muslim countries shouldn't be recognized in the United States, that too would be a violation of free exercise. That would be, it would probably violate equal protection as well to try to decertify marriages that take place um, in those countries. So uh, I guess what I'm saying is that um, we don't need any of the statutes that are being suggested around the country. We have a well-developed body of case law under the Establishment Clause, under free exercise, and under specific parts of the law to deal with all of these questions, which suggests to me that the campaign is really one of uh, political propaganda and one that is really sharply inconsistent with the spirit of toleration and mutual respect, which I think we need to have in a diverse and liberal and tolerant society so people of different religious faiths can respect each other and people of no religious faith can also respect people of different religious faiths. faiths and Vice versa. That's all I got to say.